In this talk, we're going to be addressing utilitarianism. Utilitarianism is the first of the moral theories of the present time, of what we call postmodern times, that we're going to look at. As we approach the topic of ethical theories, we need to consider our own ethical thinking. So on what basis do we, in our own minds and lives, say of something that this is wrong? What, in other words, what grounds are prohibitions? We're prohibiting something. We're saying, don't do that. And then, on what basis do we say this is good? In other words, what grounds are prescriptivity? Prescriptivity means this is to be done. This is the thing that ought to be done. In the modern world, or the Enlightenment world, the Enlightenment is a social phenomena that took place, especially in the different nations of Europe, in the 17th century through probably the middle of the 19th century. Okay, so that's the 1600s up into the 1800s. And during that time, there was, I'm going to get into this more when we study Kant, but there was a knee-jerk away from religion governing how we would do um, the politics and how we would do law and how we would do ethics. And so people began to try to do ethics apart from religion and religious codes, and that was quite a change. Prior to that time, in the West, the way that people really learned ethics was through religion and the focus on the phrase, uh, thus saith the Lord, the idea of ethics coming to people from a divine source. And typically, in the Old English, the terminology we would say was, it says, thou shalt not, and you don't, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness, and so on. And then thou shalt, the things that you are supposed to do, that you'd, you'd be people of justice and mercy and so on. So those were moral codes. So when people turn their back on moral codes because they're anchored in religion, then how is moral weightiness or a sense of obligation going to be invested into our ethical prohibitions and prescrip prescriptions since there's no longer the sense of a deity behind them when we're using them? What is going to give ethics its kind of magnetic pull, so to speak? Where would the power of the moral idea of ought come from? So theories were advanced where people tried to use either reason, that's primarily Kant, using human reason, or science, and that's primarily Bentham and Mills, the utilitarians who try to use science. You'll see this in, in terms of mathematical science. So whereas moral codes are about rules, theories are not. The Enlightenment brought about this transition, as I've said, away from moral codes to moral theories in the West. And one of the most per per persuasive theories and widespread theories of all from that time is utilitarianism. Now, do take notice of the archer symbol that we've seen throughout, and then the aiming at the bullseye, because you're going to see that the phraseology that refers to this is found in utilitarianism as well. It's found in many, many different uh, approaches to ethics. So this, this is a visual concept that communicates what we're after in ethics. So the Enlightenment is this time where societies in the West are transitioning from moral codes to moral theories. That's what's happening. And utilitarianism is also known by the name consequentialism. I'll unpack that term and its background when we get to virtue ethics and when we encounter the person of Elizabeth Anscombe. So this is a passage from the Old Testament or the Jewish book of Ecclesiastes. And what I want you to see is the end of the phrase where it says, so there is nothing new under the sun. Most of you have, have heard that phrase in your lifetime. There's nothing, well, there's nothing new under the sun, but by that it's not meant that there's nothing new technologically or in, in the realms of science. That's not the point. The idea is there's nothing new under the sun when it comes to human thought and to human nature. And that's kind of true. So, as we're approaching utilitarianism, I want to speak to you about an ancient philosophy called hedonism, because really utilitarianism is repackaged hedonism. So, look at that word, hedonism. The Greek word hedon is the root of that, and that's the word for pleasure. So, this is the study of pleasure, or pleasureism. There's two types of ancient hedonism, Cyrenaic, which is named for the island of Cyrenaea, and Epicurean. So on the island of Cyrenaea, Aristippus and his followers, Aristippus was a contemporary of Socrates. He was a student of Socrates at one point in time, but he kind of took a turn where he 
found an easy answer to how to do ethics, and he based it all just on pleasure. So the Cyrenaic form of hedonism is concerned with bodily pleasures as being the end or the telos towards which human moral behavior ought to move. Look at that word telos and think bullseye, goal, objective. It's what we're aiming at. We want to get as much pleasure as we possibly can. So the Cyrenaics weren't concerned with the future. In fact, they tended to refuse to speculate about the future. They, they were people who lived in the moment. You could, in a crass sense, say that they are like the term that we would use today, party animals. They're simply concerned to get all the bodily pleasure they could in the here and now. Now, they are in the, the 5th century BC or BCE, so the century in which Socrates arises. And then in the 4th century, in the 300s, we encounter Epicurus, and Epicurus is a contemporary of Aristotle. So Epicurus, when he looks at the hedonism of the couple generations before himself, he thinks they're onto something. He agreed with the hedonistic principle that the pleasure of each individual was the highest good, but he critiqued the crude, sensual hedonism of the Cyrenaics. And there's something that he's, he's really got in mind here. If one could quantify pain and pleasure, any pleasurable activity which ultimately ca caused more pain than the pleasure it produced was just simply not worth experiencing. In the vernacular, we know this as the law of diminishing returns. So here's an example. Let me just give you an example. If you're a drinker, if you drink a lot on Friday so that you're three sheets to the wind and feeling no pain, you're going to pay for it typically with a hangover on Saturday morning. You're going to have to hide from light and sound. You might have cotton mouth, those kind of things. If on Saturday evening, after you've had your Tylenol and ibuprofen and whatever else you did, maybe you put an ice pack on the back of your neck, you've recovered from how you felt that morning. If on Saturday evening you want to feel what you felt on Friday night, you're going to have to drink more than you did on Friday. And the truth is you'll feel a little bit less pleasure or euphoria. Typically for most people, their bodies are going to have retained some fluid because of what they did to their bodies by filling them so much with uh, whatever the, the alcohol source was that they had. And guaranteed, you're going to have a bigger headache on Sunday morning than you did on Saturday. So Epicurus was aware of this phenomenon. He thought anybody who parties in that fashion or who gets pleasure in that fashion is really not a wise person. And Epicurus certainly was not somebody who disdained physical pleasures. He thought physical pleasures were a good thing, but he thought they should be balanced with mental pleasures, with pleasures of the mind. He's kind of famous for his focus on, on the arts and on drama, and especially on the building of beautiful gardens and parks so that people could go and enjoy those aesthetic pleasures. So, in a, he, he, and he reasoned, if pleasure is the greatest good, pain is the greatest evil. So he thinks we should avoid pain. We, you're a fool to engage in something that's ultimately going to cause you more pain than pleasure. So this is Jeremy Bentham, and he is really the founder of the school of thought known as utilitarianism. In your, uh, the, one of the videos I had you watch, it referred to Bentham as possibly being somebody who had Asperger's syndrome, syndrome which is very interesting. If you're not aware, Asperger's, is, of course, is on the autism um, continuum. However, Asperger's, folks with Asperger's tend to be very high IQ, and certainly Bentham was very high IQ individual. Now, I mentioned Bentham because he roughly equates to Aristippus and the Cyrenaics. I'm going to get into that in just a little bit. So, so he, this is, when he brings us utilitarianism, it's really a repackaged form of ancient hedonism. Here's the years of his life, and he's born in London. He is a child prodigy. He read as a young toddler, and he studied Latin at age three. Folks, I've studied Latin, but certainly not at age three. That's, that's incredible. He studied law at Queen's College, Oxford, England, which tells you he was admitted into the, the, what is considered to be the premier university in the, the United Kingdom. Uh, Queen's College at Oxford is one of the best schools in the world. He earned his bachelor's at 15, and the equivalent, things work a little bit differently in the Eng English system, but the equivalent of his master's at 18 years old. I doubt that any of us are going to earn our master's at 18 years old. He is an extraordinary man. And the thing with him is he thought he'd identified 
the way to anchor ethics in something scientific, quantifiable, measurable. He says this, Nature has placed mankind under the governance of two sovereign masters, pain and pleasure. It is for them alone to point out what we ought to do, as well as to de determine what we shall do. On the one hand, the standard of right and wrong, and on the other, the chain of causes and effects are fastened to their throne. They govern us in all we do, in all we say, in all we think. Every effort we can make to throw off our subjection, meaning to them, to pain and pleasure, will serve but to demonstrate and confirm it. And so Bentham believed that ethics could be done by the scientific method using empirical observation and mathematical measurement. Now in our discussion, I gave you the elements of his hedonic calculus. Now he's on to something. The truth is, is that happiness can be measured, at least if it's in terms of pleasure, since you can have more or less pleasure. So remember this idea of aiming. An action is right insofar as it tends to produce the greatest pleasure for the greatest number. So the hedonic calculus is the way that he zeroes in on the bullseye. Okay, So think of this as the pleasure calculus. So here you go. Here's the elements. They were in your discussion. Intensity. How strong is the pleasure or pain that this act is going to give? Duration. How long am I going to get to enjoy it or are we going to get to enjoy it? Certainty or uncertainty. What's the likelihood that it's going to actually happen? Is, this a, is there a question here as to whether or not it actually will occur if I do this? Then this is not a word you use every day, propinquity or remoteness, but how soon will the pleasure or pain occur? Is it imminent or is it far off in the future? Fecundity, kind of a word meaning to be fertile and rich and full of life, but here it's used to mean the probability that the action is going to be followed by sensations of the same kind. Am I going to get more? And then purity, the probability that it will not be followed by sensations of the same kind. So it's, it's going to, is it going to be pure or is it not going to be pure? Am I going to have pleasure now and a lot of pain later? And the last bit is extent. How many people are going to get to enjoy this? So the way I like to put this is how strong, how long, how certain, how soon, what's the likelihood of more, what's the likelihood of no more of this pleasure, and how many people are going to get to enjoy it. And I think I give you that list here. Yeah, I do. So what's the likelihood of more, what's the likelihood of no more, how many get to experience it. So there's the hedonic calculus in a nutshell. So going on, this is, uh, needs to be said, especially a political concept, as far as its potentiality, needing democratic government for one to trust in its usefulness. Why do I say that? Because potentially utilitarianism, since it's speaking of the greatest good for the greatest number, has the power here for there to be what we might call the tyranny of the majority. And so democratic government is one place, where, when it's used in democratic government, well, we feel at least... I had my chance to have a voice with regard to what direction we would go with this. So it's not something that hopefully would be used in terms of a dictator or, or an oligarchy or some, some group of people making the decisions for us, kind of uh, social engineers, but it's something that especially lends itself to democratic government, whatever form that might be, whether it's a parliament or a congress or a senate or, or whatever. So the consequences of an action here determine the, the rightness or the wrongness not the motives from which it was done. That's something for you to notice. So if I did something to you where my intent was to harm you, but I in fact wound up helping you, and what I meant to be a curse to you turned out to be a blessing, in terms of utilitarianism, I did something good. Even if I didn't intend for it to be something good, it was good and it would be considered morally good. That's one of the counterintuitive things about utilitarianism. So going on from there, he says, acts are right in proportion as they tend to promote happiness and wrong as they tend to produce the reverse of happiness. So it's kind of pretty simple as far as that goes. His form of utilitarianism is called act utilitarianism because it's just built directly on acts. So this is a young man. He doesn't look young in these pictures, but a young man when Bentham is around because this is the son of his leading disciple, James Mill. And James Mill had this son, John Stuart, who grew up having uh, Bentham sort of as his godfather, so to speak, or at least his father's teacher, and his dad as well, who was a, a devotee of Bentham, both of them teaching him. And when they're teaching him, they're, they're training a prodigy. So these are the years of his life. He also was born in London. He's the son of James Mill, a philosopher, an economist, and an official with the East India 
Tea Company, which was a big force for trade, world trade, in that time. He's educated by his father and Jeremy Bentham. He's homeschooled, so to speak. Now, whereas Bentham learned Latin at age three, he learned Greek at age three. So it tells us they're going in the direction of studying the classics. Now, Mill was, uh, both of these men, it should be said, let me hit the pause button for a second and say both Bentham and Mill, and I think you've already seen this in some of what you've read, were men who were very progressive. They were very much for things that are uh, would be a long time in coming as far as them being accepted in society. They did not think that uh, gay or lesbian acts should be illegal and be punishable by jail, which was the case in their time. They kind of had a live and let live view towards gay and lesbian people. Um, they believed in women's rights and they thought women should have a right to vote. There's a lot of places where they were very progressive and ahead of their time as far as the things that they viewed. And, and Mill did not change his views on these things. But here, this last bullet point, you can see that he suffered a nervous breakdown at 20, and he credited his recovery to romantic poetry. Well, that's a kind of an interesting thing. What, what's that about? So he had sort of, I, I would call it a conversion, but it's not a religious conversion. Rather, it is a conversion to aesthetic pleasure. He's been raised with his dad and with Bentham, and their incredible emphasis upon mathematics and the sciences, and, his, and Bentham was really interested in things having to do um, with um, jurisprudence and with uh, penology and criminology and so on. Um, and so he was raised with those very serious topics around him all the time and a very um, truncated approach to life as far as aesthetic pleasures went. And he one winds up discovering the poetry of Wordsworth, and he credits it with saving his life after this nervous breakdown. And he is headed in a different direction from Bentham after that. So he wants a less black and white, in terms of pain and pleasure, account of the world. He concludes that cultural, intellectual, and spiritual pleasures, that doesn't mean religious per se, are of greater value than mere physical pleasures. Now, who does that sound like? That sounds like Epicurus. So he says that these things would be valued more highly by competent judges. Now, his line of thought may sound a little bit odd, but it does make sense if you give it some thought. Do you recall your meal last Thanksgiving? Do you remember the food that you ate at that time? And if you're able to, does remembering it give you pleasure now? Of course not. But why? because it was a physical pleasure. Physical pleasures, this is something that was observed in the ancient world, give us intense pleasure, but it's temporary, very much dependent on the existential experience. Whether it's food or drink or substances or sex, the pleasure is intense, but when it's over, it's over. Conversely, aesthetic pleasures are more lasting. For example, a couple of years ago, I went to the Bangor waterfront with my wife and we saw a Celtic woman performing. All I have to do right now is close my eyes and think, I can see and hear those amazing musicians and singers and dancers once again. I can savor them in my memory because they were an aesthetic pleasure. And, you know, 10 years from now, my wife and I may look at one another and say, remember when we went to see Celtic Woman? It was like, oh yeah, wasn't that amazing? Because it's an aesthetic pleasure. So Mill is on to something that our aesthetic pleasures are not as intense, but they're more lasting in their duration. So there was a critique of his mentor, a critique of uh, Bentham made by a famous philosopher of, of the time, Thomas Carlyle, where he said Bentham's philosophy is a pig's philosophy. So Mill understood Carlyle to be saying that Bentham's sort of utilitarianism claims that life has no higher end than pleasure, no better and nobler object of desire and pursuit. That's his own words. He doesn't want to be perceived in that way. He takes this to mean that in the eyes of people coming from Carlyle's way of looking at things, such a philosophy is in in John Stuart Mill's words, utterly mean and groveling, a doctrine worthy only of swine. He wants something greater than that, better than that. He did understand the brilliance of Bentham, who was his mentor, but he also recognized its limitations and its failings. In response to Carlyle's critique of Bentham, Mill famously said, better to be Socrates dissatisfied than a pig satisfied. So he's distancing himself from just act utilitarianism and the focus on pleasure that that has, on, on just outright physical pleasure. He's stepping away from that. So he believed he could do better than Bentham, and he ultimately sets about to write his own utilitarian theory.
So for Mills, his utilitarianism is cultural, intellectual, and spiritual pleasures are of greater value than mere physical pleasure, because according to him, the former, those pleasures, rather than physical pleasures, would be valued more highly by competent judges than the latter. And for him, a competent judge is anyone who's experienced both the lower pleasures and the higher ones. He's an advocate of what we would call rule utilitarianism. What he says is, you obey those rules which experience has shown will produce the greatest happiness of the greatest number. When you always know what people will do, you get predictability and security. So what we can say is Mill was a progressive regarding social things, but when it came to ethics, he was a bit of a conservative, especially regarding moral rules. Although he famously disliked conservatives, he believed there was room for improvement in his society, but he didn't want to rush it. So typically, it's usually the younger who are more progressive and the older who are more conservative. But things are kind of flipped when we talk about Bentham and Mill. He's a little bit more conservative than, than Bentham is with this. He didn't want to move away from traditional values too quickly. He wanted to keep on doing the things that experience had shown would make for general human well-being until reason demonstrated that it was safe and good to do otherwise. In order to do that, you needed to be a rule utilitarian. So this is just a little chart to contrast the two of them. You can see greatest good, meaning pleasure, for Bentham, and greatest happiness for the greatest number for Mill. So happiness is a little bit more robust term than just pleasure. It's very much like Epicurus's idea of happiness. And for Bentham, it's focused primarily on the individual moral agent. And Mill, it's concerned both with the individual and the common good. Now, that's not to say Bentham never spoke about the common good, but we'll, we'll get into this stuff. So for Bentham, it's quantitative. It's the hedonic calculus. For Mill, it's qualitative mixed together with quantitative. And so it's higher versus lower pleasures. Bentham is an act utilitarian. He's just really concerned primarily with pleasure in the being weighed in the scales as over against pain and the emphasis on pleasure. But for Mill, he wants to have that there'd be the rule that we would, we would go by what has worked in society until through our utilitarian reasoning, we might come up with something that works better. But he wants to put the brakes on about changing everything and having it be like pure act utilitarianism. Both of them are using consequentialist reasoning, which means the consequences of the act are what make it good. Now that's where I'm going to end, and we will come back to this topic in the next lecture.